Welcome to 1111 at the Grotto. My name is Adam, and on behalf of all of us here, we're so thankful that you've chosen to join us today. Whether this is your first time with us or you're joining us again, 1111 is a chance for us to sing a song based on the Psalms, which are songs of praise, and for us to dive into the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus. This is a chance for us to make church a little less scary, for us to unpack what it is that God wants for us in our lives. From wheels up to wheels down, it's never more than like 15 or 20 minutes. you really quick. You don't have to shout it out if you don't want to, but what is your favorite holiday? Does anybody have a favorite holiday? You're, you're, okay, my son Gus said his birthday. I didn't know that that was a national holiday, but it's a good one. All right. Anybody else? A favorite holiday? <laughs> Mother's Day and Father's Day. Anyone else? Christmas. Obviously, Christmas is a great one, right? Because we get gifts and stuff. Mine, over the last decade or so, has become Thanksgiving. Now, when I was growing up, Thanksgiving was a rather uneventful holiday. I come from the most bland, basic stock 
possible. The turkey was always dry. And I know if my mom ever sees or hears this, she's going to kill me. The turkey was never like that great. And like, no, I will say my mom makes a great pumpkin pie. And I look forward to my mom's pumpkin pie whenever I get to have Thanksgiving with my family. But Thanksgiving was never a big deal. I married into a family that Thanksgiving is their Super Bowl and their Stanley Cup. It is the biggest time of year for everybody. It is bigger than Christmas. It's bigger than anything. It is a big deal when we celebrate Thanksgiving in my wife's family. And I discovered something that I did not know was possible when it comes to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, big meal, everyone's together, the food is delicious, there's a thousand of everything. I've never been to a meal with multiple turkeys. A thousand sides, a thousand desserts. It comes in shifts and waves. It starts right around lunchtime and it ends at like midnight. And then my, my, my wife's uncle Adam showed me something miraculous about Thanksgiving. And it's not Thanksgiving Day. It's the day after. Leftover Thanksgiving in my family now is just as big as actual Thanksgiving. And my uncle Adam has shown me how to construct the absolutely perfect leftover sandwich. He is surgical <laughs> with how he prepares this thing. It's, there's the right kind of bread and there's the right amount of gravy and the stuffing and the cranberry and the turkey. And it is literally... I, I can't explain it to you properly because you can't see the island in the kitchen at my wife's aunt's house because we go there every Thanksgiving and it is just covered with food. And somehow it is an absolute miracle on par with Jesus himself, how he manages to fit every type of food from this table within two pieces of bread. <laughs> and it is the best bite. The first time that this ever happened to me, it was like I saw just a glimpse of heaven. It was the best bite of sandwich I'd ever had in my life. I didn't know it was possible. And it, it started me thinking this week when we talk about this week's gospel, the importance of leftovers. Because if you really think about it, the best food, in my opinion, are leftovers. Like, for me, cold pizza the next day, uh, it doesn't go in a microwave or an oven. I want cold pizza. I know some of you are shaking your head at me like I'm nuts, but it's true. You can't make good fried rice without day-old rice from the night before, right? That's where the best food comes from, is sometimes in leftovers. And when we talk about this week's gospel, it's one of the accounts of this thing called the multiplication of the fish and loaves. Jesus is with his followers, and he's teaching them. And he says, uh, they say, like, hey, master, we have to do something because there's all of these people here. And there's no, we have to send them away so that they can eat and find a police place to stay. So they go, what are we supposed to do? We got to send them away. We don't know what to do because it says that the crowd, and again, the Bible does this thing sometimes where it doesn't count everybody, but it talks about that there's 5,000 men in the crowd. So it's 5,000 men not counting any women or children. They're like, what are we going to do? He said, you figure it out. And so he says, okay, let's do this. Get them together in groups of about 50. That's a big group. So now they're in these big groups of 50. And they manage to find some fish and some bread. In one account of this story, they say that they find a child, a boy, who is carrying some fish and bread, and they take it from the boy. So they rob a kid of his lunch. <laughs> and what happens is Jesus takes this, he prays over it, and then they all start eating. And there's not really like a good description of what that looks like. Sometimes I think we have this idea that like fish and bread start falling out of the sky or that these just mounds just keep popping up. But I kind of like to think that it's getting passed around and there just keeps being enough. And there never just stops being enough. And everybody eats their fill. And it says at the end of this story that there was so much food left over that it fills 12 wicker baskets. That's a lot of food to come from three fish and a couple of loaves. 
But the weirdest part of that story is nobody talks about what happens with the leftovers. What happens with the food after that? And this is actually kind of interesting. Something that's particularly interesting about this account in Luke's gospel and about the gospel of Luke in general is that I did some research and approximately one-fifth of the gospel of Luke are stories that take place around a meal. It is one of the prevailing themes in the entire gospel of Luke. They talk about people gathering around a meal. It happens in this story. He talks about there's multiple times where he dines with Pharisees and tax collectors and single women, which is scandalous for Jewish culture at that time. For somebody in a position like Jesus's to be around single women eating dinner at their homes. It happens on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. But most importantly, I think, we all kind of know the story of the Last Supper. Time and time again, Jesus gathers people around a table and miraculous things happen. We talked last week about what we talk about or what we think about when we hear about the miraculous. Sometimes it is large. You feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a few fish and loaves. And sometimes it's a little bit smaller. But it always, ha- it always seems to happen around these tables. We only seem to have a little bit in our lives to offer sometimes. We look at what, what are we supposed to be doing? You know, okay, I have a, okay, I'm trying to figure out this God thing. How can I offer anything that God can use? And sometimes it's the very little things that he has placed in our lives that he's asking us to trust him with. And we, I think, sometimes are hesitant to give the little things that we have because we're afraid of what happens when we let those things go. I'm sure that in the gospel account where they ask the kid for his fish and his bread, which probably wasn't his, he was probably taking it home to his family, and then these grown men just accost him and steal his lunchbox, I'm pretty sure he was not only worried about what it was going to do for him, but, oh my God, my mom's going to kill me, my dad's going to kill me, I don't know how we're going to eat, now these guys have the, what am I supposed to do? And what God is asking us to do in all of these scenarios is to take that little bit that we have and give to him. Now, this is not me or anyone telling you what to do about money. This isn't a money thing, because sometimes some people in some churches use this as a way to kind of almost extort money out of people to say, hey, you know what, if you, if you just give your seed of $27, God's going to, no, that's not what this is about upstairs earlier you heard about the need for us to be a part of the local church to be willing to serve others even in small ways and that's what this is calling us to do this week when we hear about this miracle of fish and loaves we are called to step out into our discomfort to offer others what we may have so that they may develop a relationship with Jesus those leftovers for sure went and helped others. Because I think sometimes we, I, as like a American, think like, oh, there's all this leftovers. May as well throw it away. I've done that so many times. There's plenty of times where I will cook for my family, my just my little house of four, and be like, okay, well, we got leftovers. But I'm just, I just dump them in the trash, or I'll do what I actually do, which is I'll find a Tupperware container. I put it in the Tupperware container. It sits in my refrigerator for a week. I look at the Tupperware container. I say, this has become a science experiment, and then I throw the Tupperware container in the garbage. But for sure, those wicker baskets did not get wasted. Those wicker baskets continued to feed more people. God is calling us to take those little things that we have and feed many. You know, sometimes you'll hear this, the, these three things that we talk about when it, when it comes to giving. Time, talent, and treasure. So treasure, obviously. We all have abilities that other people don't have. When we were putting the grotto back together, so many people gave of their time and their abilities to make this place come together. Very specifically, you know, like things like the fountain. Kent worked really hard to get that fountain working for us. We have our time that we can give to people. Just being present to people. 
sometimes is that little bit of fish and loaves that God has the ability to multiply and bless. So the call for us is what are we going to do in our own lives when we go home today? What are we going to do that's going to bless others with the little bit that we have? What is it that we have that God has placed in our hands, in our lunchbox, that we're willing to help turn into leftovers? My hope is that as we go out of here, as we go back into our workplaces or our schools or our communities, that we're willing to be generous with that little bit. That we realize that God is a powerful God even in the leftovers. Don't throw it away. Don't let it sit in the back of your fridge. Hey, thanks again for joining us for 1111 at the Grotto. If you have any questions about the Grotto, 1111, or anything else, visit us online and connect with us at thegrotto.community. Thank you.